it's nice to see so much work happening in Spain. As I say, I feel that you are my cousins being in, uh, uh, in close distance, at least by train, uh, to, for, in terms of future collaborations. I'm uh, originally English, so I uh, trained at the Institute of Neurology in London. Um, I'm going to show some data from, from, from those days because they lead up to the more recent stuff. So uh, I'll show you right up to uh, quite a lot of unpublished data. It's going to be um, lots of techniques. Um, so please ask questions if you, uh, if you get uh, uh, any misunderstandings. So I work at the, uh, the, un the engineering university, partly uh, in Madrid, and also at the, uh, the Queen Sophia Foundation for Alzheimer's Research is the other affiliation. So my lab really focuses on, uh, on memory, which has started an ERC grant uh, to focus down a few experimental questions, important questions on uh, the data that we've acquired so far. So I'm going to uh, talk to you really two parts of the study. We have time to go into part two. So really, part one is about how to make your memory better. Uh, and the second part is how to deliberately make it worse. Uh, I have a clinical background. And um, I think most diseases can either be described as having too little of something or too much. So low blood pressure, high blood pressure, blood too thick, blood too thin. Uh, and memory is no different. So you have conditions in which your memory is weak uh, or dysfunctional, like in the dementias or many psychiatric disorders. Uh, and you have memory that's too strong in some conditions, like post-traumatic stress, anxiety, or, or phobias. Right, when we talk about memory, um, the, the, the commonplace because I know that quite a few of you don't have a uh, psychology background. So this is an, quite an old-fashioned way of looking at memory, but it still serves a purpose, where the uh, conscious memory, for like what, what you did uh, yesterday evening on, on the rooftop, uh, really is dependent on the hippocampus here, uh, shown uh, in red, whereas there's various other uh, types of uh, memory, like classical conditioning, Pavlov and his dogs, or fear conditioning, so when you develop uh, <coughs> associations between an unpleasant outcome and, and a stimulus, dependent on the amygdala. Now, there are quite a lot of exceptions to this squire-esque uh, uh, dichotomy, um, and you will see that a lot of these structures that are thought to be non-declarative in nature actually in, uh, interact with the hippocampus to uh, influence memory. So. Different techniques going down from psychology to electroconvulsive therapy. I'm going to uh, take you through the lab's been up to. Um, so how to make memory better? Well, the easiest way, I think, to make memory be better is to make something emotionally impactful. So the father of modern day psychology, William James, already over 100 years ago said an impression can maybe so exciting emotionally as to almost leave a scar on the cerebral tissues. Now, what is that scar? And that's one of the main uh, focuses of, uh, of, uh, of my research. What is this um, What is this effect in the brain that emotion leaves us? This is a, we, we have a, a prior hypothesis based on work from the 60s and 70s in rodents that, the, that this upregulation of memory for emotional stimuli has to do with the amygdala uh, and the hippocampus and is mediated uh, through adrenaline. So adrenaline that can be released by the adrenal glands in the body, but you also have the adrenergic system in the brain, which is based uh, some the cell bodies in the locus ceruleus. Um, so this is the, the mechanism uh, that I explored quite early on when I was in, uh, in London using uh, this really quite simple task. So you present uh, people with lists of words, uh, they're semantically related words, and occasionally, one of those words is an emotional oddball. So it's emotionally negative in the context of neutral stimuli. So here, massacre when you're talking about groups. Uh, here, you have some that are perceptually odd um, that are in a different typeface. At the end of seeing a list of words, you then do a count backwards and then do uh, as a distractor task and then do free recall. And uh, unsurprisingly, it has been known since the 30s called the von Restorff effect. When they're perceptually and emotionally uh, distinct, you have better memory for them. We did this uh, study in the context of uh, a drug that blocks your adrenaline system. So these are called beta blockers. You may have heard of them. People use them uh, in anxiety or when uh, they, some people use them when they have to do public speaking, exactly. So they're called 
propranolol is the first one that was discovered. Um, so let's just think about the placebo group. So this didn't have a, a, a drug. When you look at the oddball words versus the control words, you see that there is an enhancement for the emotional item here, quite large, about 30% relative to the other words, and also for the, for the perceptual words. The group that had the beta blocker, so this is an oral pill, a propranolol of 40 milligrams, 90 minutes before the study, this enhancement for uh, the emotional items uh, is completely taken away. So good evidence then that, you know, that there is something going on with the adrenergic system uh, in emotional memory uh, in coding. We then looked at this uh, using functional MRI. So uh, a non-invasive non indirect technique, but it gives us a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of information where to focus further hypotheses on. So we repeated the same uh, task during encoding, uh, the drug was present or placebo, and they had recognition after quite a few of the drug half-lives had, had gone through. Um, and we did something called a subsequent memory type analysis, which is worth taking note because uh, quite a few of the studies that I'll, I'll talk about use this type of analysis. So basically, you see that you, you look at activity to each and every item uh, that, that is presented to the subject. They then have a, a memory task, and you then go back retrospectively and bin the trials depending on whether they're subsequently remembered or forgotten, right? So it's a way of looking at successful encoding. It's called the, the subsequent memory effect. And when you do this for, uh, for this task, you see that in the placebo group, the subsequent memory is in the amygdala. So this is uh, the amygdala and coronal, uh, sagittal and, and transverse sections, so bilateral uh, amygdala. The responses to remembered emotional items versus forgotten emotional items. And this has an interaction with, uh, with drugs. So it's only present in the placebo group, you can see here, but not in the propranolol group. So having shown behaviorally that the propranolol blocks, uh, blocks the emotional enhancement effect, we now show that the, at encoding, the effect is uh, associated with a reduction of the amygdala response. If you then look at recognition, now keep in mind that the, uh, that the propranolol is no longer present. You see that the interaction uh, of uh, the correct, uh, uh, correct hits versus rejections is in the hippocampus. So something happens at encoding that later uh, sets up a hippocampal response when you remember the emotional items. And that doesn't happen if you've been given propranolol during the encoding. So this was evidence to begin with that we had uh, there's some sort of interaction between these two structures, amygdala and hippocampus, during this emotional memory. So during this scar of the cerebral tissues, as, what, uh, as, uh, as William James said. We do a little deeper um, with this hypothesis using a combination of functional MRI and voxel-based morphometry in patients with medial temporal damage. So these are uh, patients with hippocampal sclerosis. Um, a lot of these cases have medically intractable epilepsy and later go on to have uh, some of them in intracranial recordings. Um, so with hippocampal sclerosis, it can extend anteriorly into the amygdala. So you, may, you have patients, uh, therefore, with variable, variable amounts of hippocampal damage and variable amounts of amygdala damage. And we ran uh, the, same, the same task on these patients. So they saw a list of words and had a, a occasion when one was emotional, like here in murder. And then they had a recognition test outside of the scanner. So we first looked at whether there was um, a structural correlate. So this term I use, voxel-based morphometry, for those of you that don't work in, in MRI. What you do is you segment the brain into gray matter, white matter, CSF, uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And each, uh, each value, each cube of the brain, that's the voxel. So voxel is volume element, is the pixel uh, equivalent in volumes. Uh, you look at each and every voxel, so each and every cube in the brain and its level of gray matter density, which is zero to one. Um, and you then do, you can basically look the whole brain for correlations with a particular, uh, for a particular experimental variable. In this case, we looked at uh, gray matter density across the whole brain and recognition accuracy for emotional stimuli. And we see that uh, there's an effect here in the left amygdala when you look at whole brain. And that actually is the interaction for emotional versus neutral stimuli. So the amygdala is only here in red, interested in the uh, recognition accuracy for 
uh, emotional items and not for the neutral items. Okay, so let's look at behavior and function. So we now know we have a, 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 a through another technique, another group of uh, experimental subjects, amygdala emotional memory enhancement. But what about the amygdala hippocampal interaction? Um, what we've done here is look at the amount of encoding related activity, so the fMRI response in the hippocampus, dependent on the integrity of the amygdala. So for this, the, we use the amygdala T2. So this is a measure of, uh, of damage. So the higher the, the T2, the worse off the amygdala is. And we see here, so in the subject that have good amygdalas, they have the bigger hippocampal responses for emotional stimuli. Uh, but there's no effect from the neutral. Whereas here, we look at hippocampal volume. So the bigger the hippocampal volume is, the less fluorosis is that there is. So the bigger the hippocampal volume, the more amygdala related uh, response. So then the conclusion there, that the amygdala and hippocampus are uh, coupled during emotional episodic memory encoding. So there's something about these two structures. Uh, there's something there to do with the adrenergic system as well. But what does this mean? So what's the mechanism? What's going on? Uh, this is as far as we can go with uh, a non-invasive technique. Uh, so then return to intracranial recordings uh, to look a little bit more in detail. Um, this is work in progress uh, with my two epileptologists, uh, Helnago uh, and Toledano, and with my colleague Stefan Moratti uh, in Madrid. We're looking particularly at patients that have electrodes that are placed within the amygdala and the hippocampus to look at the uh, coupling during an emotional memory task. Uh, so the number of patients that we have so far recorded over the last five years is, is large. We've done probably 40 cases uh, so far. And from those, as uh, I was discussing yesterday with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Diego, about the actual yield you have in this patient. So the, the ones that don't have too many epileptic spikes that have a decent performance, that don't have a seizure in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the experiment. Uh, we still, we're down to uh, an end of 14. We have eight subjects that have, uh, eight patients that have both amygdala and, uh, and hippocampal electrodes. And that's our, our cohort we're looking at. So this is the way we're reconstructing uh, our electro positions. These are thresholded CT from the, for those of you that were in the workshop uh, in the afternoon, so we do a similar procedure. So this is uh, to localize the electrodes of these are the, the raw uh, CTs overlaid on the MRI. And you can see the contacts through a thresholding of the Hounsfield units of the CT. Um, we look particularly at the electrodes within the anterior hippocampus. Uh, most of the electrodes are actually there. Uh, because the, it's more the anterior hippocampus that has this uh, connectivity with the, uh, with the amygdala. So Manuela Costa, postdoc in the lab, is, uh, is driving this forward. So this is a task that the subjects do. Uh, so during encoding, they uh, make an indoor-outdoor response to face to images. So they're uh, either neutral or unpleasant images derived from the IAPS database. They can be. Uh, quite unpleasant some of these pictures. So the patients obviously see one example before uh, the experiment and are asked whether they'd be willing to see this type of picture um, before they consent. The following day, they do a recognition task in which they do this uh, judgment of whether they remember having seen the item before, whether they feel a, a sense of familiarity with the item or whether they think the item uh, is new. Behaviorally, this is across the uh, across all the patients. You see that the the highest memory is for the emotional remembered condition. The, the uh, emotional familiarity uh, responses basically they don't they, they're performing a chance. So we we focused on the on the remembered items, um, and we looked at this specific, specifically in the um, in the time frequency domain. So for those of you, who, well, I think everyone here has. A, there's some sort of signal processing background. So you take the raw signal and then decompose it into the different uh, into different frequencies and study whether uh, the different different frequency bands are uh, whether the power of those frequency bands is associated with different stimulus types um, as a, as a function of the experiment. And what we see here, if you just look 
without without going into too much detail, what we see here, the ER condition, so the emotional remembered condition from the amygdala uh, is clearly the one with the most activity in the gamma uh, in the gamma range. <coughs> yeah. Emotion, uh, emotional stimulus recognized. You have lumped together uh, cross valence or you have negative cross valence separate? I don't have positive. Ah. Yeah. In these experiments, there's no positive. Yeah. Good question. I'm. I'm not sure whether the amygdala really does that positive valence in humans, so the evidence is a little bit mixed. Uh, yeah, so I want clean results. Yeah, so just, and also there's very few conditions in which you have too much happiness. So um, I, I do a lot of this with uh, <laughs> no pathological conditions. Yeah, so a lot of this work, I, I have a, a, a sort of focus with PTSD and anxiety uh, disorders, and this typically associated with negative right. memories. So that's the that's the the bigger picture. Right. So that's why I don't. You know, I have one example of uh, positive emotion that I'll show you of laughing monkeys in, in a little bit. Um, you put note on this: that IM's database was built in the seventies and eighties, and we have validated it again now uh, two years ago. That you see that arousal responses to the stimuli is much reduced for the current subjects as compared to the reference mm. evaluations of 30 years ago. People have become more desensitized. Yeah, and for that reason, uh, it was worth looking into these more updated uh, validated data sets that we have done. Okay, well, we'll talk so about that later. That's good to know. Yeah. If arousal is relevant for you, it's really something to take into account. You have about a 20% reduction. Okay. People desensitize because the media now allows everything to be put on TV. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, well, the, the interaction, we still have an interaction in the high gamma range here at about 100 hertz um, for emotionally remembered versus uh, the neutral stimuli. Whereas the hippocampus uh, subjects, they, they uh, here, hippocampus is really involved in remembering in general. Uh, so this is the dissociation that we would have expected, actually. So the amygdala has an interaction, uh, uh, has a subsequent memory by emotion interaction, whereas the hippocampus is more subsequent memory. Uh, quite interesting, something we can talk about later. The gamma ranges are different for the two uh, for the two structures. What they're doing. Um, No, they're distinct. So this is 60 to 80, and this is 100 to 120. So the preliminary data we show we have, and I'm not going to go into it, but the, 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 they have to stay at their frequencies. Because if the amygdala drives the hippocampus at its own frequency, they forget that item. So having shown that, we then want to look at how, uh, how the two structures interact, because this is just its own local processing. Um, so one thing we've looked at is something called phase amplitude coupling. So how the phase of an ongoing slow oscillation uh, modulates the power or the amplitude of the higher oscillation uh, and whether there's interaction between the two uh, structures. So this is uh, called the envelope method. So you basically look at the, uh, the you bandpass filter the gamma in the range, you have a significant effect and then see what the, uh, see what the oscillation on top of that is or how the envelope of the oscillations so you see here that the the gamma is faster in the amygdala here and then in the hippocampus it's quite clearly it's a single trial um, and we see that the when the when the when the gamma is organized at about a 10 hertz in the amygdala or 11 hertz uh, you tend to have the emotion remembered whereas in the hippocampus is slightly lower uh, at the uh, in the theta range. This is another way to look at this. This is frequency for phase, this is frequency for amplitude. And what was really interesting is that if you take the amygdala theta and look at the uh, hippocampal gamma, you also see that there's coupling between the two uh, oscillations. So somehow the amygdala ongoing theta is influencing the, the, the gamma oscillations in, uh, in the hippocampus. So there's something we're trying to pin down now to see whether the phase, uh, the phase of the ongoing theta in the hippocampus is a couple to different uh, different phases, a couple to the to the power, to look at how the the, the interaction of information may be uh, taking place. It's quite exciting to find. Um, so yeah, 
why is this important? Well, the, if, if, if you organize gamma, that will have an influence on the, the spiking of different neurons, uh, particularly according to you know, John, John Listman theories, et cetera, Ole Jensen, and could be influencing your synaptic plasticity. So that could be the substrate uh, of how the uh, amygdala hippocampus interacts to produce this stronger memory or the scar that, uh, uh, that William James said. Okay, so that was emotion. Another way, if you want to make your memory better, is move. So this was a very strange paper I read in 1991 from Halgren, yeah, 91, uh, that stuck in my mind. So what Halgren showed, so he was one of the pioneers of integrating recordings, and what he showed uh, in this paper that didn't get much notice uh, is that when, when, the, when the patient moved, moved his tongue or moved the arm, you'd have firing of the hippocampal units that he was recording from. And I always thought that was quite strange. Uh, why would that come about? Because you think memory system, motor system, more independent. Um, but then more recently, there's been work in monkeys um, looking at movement-related activity in the locus ceruleus. So this is the adrenergic, uh, the adrenergic cell bodies that I mentioned. So uh, when the monkey makes a movement or even makes a saccadic eye movement, before the movement is made, you have firing of the locus uh, ceruleus neurons. It's actually been shown in the 70s in the cats, but it was uh, more recently in the, in the monkeys. So it got me thinking that maybe the same adrenaline that we see that's responsible for upregulating up memory for emotional stimuli might be present when you make a movement and then might upregulate memory when you're uh, in the process of making a movement. Right, so simple hypothesis. A uh, PhD student, Mar Yebra, who's now at UCLA, uh, did this. So it was a simple task. You've probably heard of go, no go. So you have a cue to either make a movement or not to make a movement. Um, so the color, the color of the, the frame told you to go and no go. Um, and there was a picture presented that was incidental to the task. The subjects didn't know they were having a memory test um, one hour later. So surprise recognition test. And this was equal, equal problems go, no go. Normally the no goes are 20 or 30%, but it's 50, 50. Otherwise they'd be rare items, so oddball items, and they have, it would skew the memory test. Uh, she did lots of experiments, including um, incentive with uh, financial reward, uh, different delays between the cue and the onset of the stimulus. Did it with fMRI, we did it with pupillometry, uh, and also with uh, a manipulation of emotion. And to cut a long story short, across all the experiments, she so found a, a significant increase for subsequent memory, subsequent memory responses that would have been paired with the movement as opposed to a no-go response. So this was uh, roughly the same, whether they were given money, whether it was a staggered response, we've reduced the, the stimulation, the, the, the stimulus duration to 250 milliseconds, then take it into the fMRI. Uh, so you wouldn't have so many eye movements, uh, and also with pupillometry. And with the fMRI results, the only the only area in the whole brain that, uh, that showed a significant interaction between movement and memory was here. Um, now, this is we've done different ways of, of localizing brainstem responses because they're not reliable, particularly in fMRI. Uh, just sorry, a, just a question. Mm. When you go back to the slide. Yeah. Uh, so it's here, there are two possible explanations. One is movement itself, and one is the suppression of the movement in the other condition. So how do you know if it's not the second one, not the later one? Very good. So that was one of the reasons for doing the staggered uh, memory. So we did either present the cue uh, to move or not move, and the picture at the same time for 250 milliseconds, or then waited 250 milliseconds. So the, or then had another 250 milliseconds. I think I have a slide at the end that I can show you. Um, because the idea is that the inhibitory related um, electrophysiological activity, so the N200 that's most related with the inhibition, that happens very early. So if you present the stimulus after that time window, so with a latency of 500 milliseconds, you shouldn't see, uh, you shouldn't see the inhibition-induced uh, uh, memory, memory disadvantage. So we didn't see an effect. So it doesn't matter whether it's staggered. And also, um, what we did was to 
look at the number of preceding goes before a no-go. So if you have lots of goes and then, then you have a, a no-go, it's more difficult to withhold your response and you have what's called commission errors. So you tend to go on those trials. So we see that when inhibition is most taxed, you make movement errors, but your memory is not affected. Can you, can you step us through more carefully um, what the manipulation exactly is? So in this case, if you look at movement, right? So in this experiment, what, what does movement exactly translate to when I'm your subject? Button press. It's only the button press. It's only button press. Okay. Space bar. Yeah. How do you rule out the attention component here? Because he has this impression component, yes, but still the noble position requires more attention. Do you think? Some people, or like some reviewers argue that the, the go condition make, makes more attention. I mean, for the go, you need more kind of effort, but for the no go condition, you need to kind of like pay attention to not pressing the button to try to be. So, and then we know that memory is required, if memory is performing uh, depending on the attention. So, if you have less attention dedicated to memorizing, then it's more likely to see it decay and uh, before the repo Again, that was the one of the, the reasons why we looked at the item effects before. So you have most attention when you've had a series of uh, a series of go responses. Uh, that's the most taxing. The most taxing after if you have four or five, although it's equal probable overall, the experiment, 50%, 50%. If you have five, just stochastically, you can have runs of goes and then a no-go. That's attention demanding more than a series of no-goes. And that doesn't have uh, so any more manipulation. It's more less attention in terms of selective control. Mm -hmm. Divided attention. Of course, selective attention will be higher in the go condition because you can pay full attention to the stimulus itself. And basically, you know that you have to press. While in the divided condition, in the no go condition, you have to pay attention on the motor. So, pressing the motor response. And what, uh, that's but, where yeah, the, pr the problem with the attention argument is that you have a, also, you have a target detection attention bias for the go. So it depends which psychologist you speak to. Uh, so this is, I mean, the, you can see the debates in the, in the because we, all the reviewers' comments uh, are posted on with the paper that came out a, a few weeks ago. Um, but I, I should have a, it's more slides at the end than I can, I can show you. Um, so yeah, Paul, what you were saying, so here, uh, so for this experiment, it was basically one second stimulus duration. The person had to press the space bar. Um, well, first, I just press the space bar for the go responses for all uh, the stimulus. Here, we made them, the faster they went, the more money they got. And if they made a commission error, so they pressed when they shouldn't, they got money taken away. In the end, they were all paid the same to make it ethical. But um, here is the staggered condition. I'll show you a slide up. This is the same as experiment one, but just shorter presentation time of the stimulus. So they didn't make eye movements. Uh, this is with, with an fMRI, which is the same. And pupillometry was when we measured the pupil diameter. Um, so this is the in the fMRI experiment. We see this blue is a is a is a mask, a probabilistic mask for where the locus ceruleus should be, uh, and the red is the the activation. Now we follow this up with a pupillometry study, which I can uh, show you at the end for those that are interested, and find the same interaction. So the pupil dilation uh, that is thought to be a surrogate a good indicator of locus ceruleus activity uh, showed the same interaction. But now I could argue, if I sort of squint a little bit, that we are maybe looking at brainstem motor nuclei. Right? Be they're very close there. I completely agree with you. I mean, that's where we did the, the pupillometry study because this this came out. We, we're expecting other areas to come out in the interaction. We're really expecting hippocampus or something. And the hippocampus comes out in the main effects of memory uh, or parahippocampal cortex. So when I saw this, and it's the only thing in the entire brain, uh, I thought, that's interesting. So this does fit with the monkey data. How reliable is it? Let's do pupillometry to, to, uh, to really get to another indirect measure. For the moment, though, I don't think there are any patients that have stimulation of the Lucas, the Lucas ceruleus, so we can't uh, do a direct recording for direct evidence. So we did the pupillometry, and another thing we did um, was test for an interaction with emotion. So if it's all adrenaline-based, and the ad adrenaline affects the emotional memory encoding and the action-induced memory enhancement, the two 
uh, factors should interact. So, so basically we had a, the same task, but half of the stimuli were emotionally aversive and half of the stimuli were emotionally neutral. So the same IAPTS pictures with the idea that uh, if you have this inverted U-shaped uh, curve for arousal, so the noradrenaline level increases. So here, if it's low to high, for go, this is a no-go and go with the, the button press and the LC activity. If you move to the right, uh, then you should see perhaps a flip in the effect. Uh, so the additional, uh, the go plus the emotionality should produce a worsening because you're now too aroused. Uh, and well, this is what we, what we found. So this is the neutral go versus no go. You see the enhancement here and the the emotional go versus no go, and it flips around. So you have a, uh, an interaction between the emotionality and the go, as you predicted. Yes? I think it would be interesting to plot the, the beta weights for the different conditions here on the MRI. Because um, you know, there is an old story by uh, Aston Jones, and we also had a paper in which we wrote about what these LC signals may, may, may signify. There is some evidence, both in monkeys and humans, that whenever there is an endotrial, the end of a, of a cognitive state of some sort, where the go-no-go -no -go is an example, um, there is basically at the end of the trial, there is a phasic response, which in Aston Jones saw, saw in the local ceruleus, and we saw throughout the brain in fMRI, through the visual cortex and brain stem, so maybe there is a modulation of this offset signal that relates, you know, which may be you know, higher in the, in the go condition as compared to the no go. But I think I suspect that there must be fairly widespread signals at the end of the trial, even in the staggered condition, uh, that includes all the possible. So I think it would be good, interesting, and as you plot the, you know, the local, the, as you plot the pupillometry responses for this interaction, it might be interesting. Oh, this is the this is the beta weights for the. Oh, in the fMRI. Yeah, this is fMRI. Yeah. Okay, but what about in the rest of the brain? So this is, the interaction was only this at point zero zero one. Oh, I know. Uh, correctly. If you look at if you look at the you know the main <coughs> position in, in, in the rest of the brain. Oh, no, just go know. versus no go. Well, just plot you know beta weights for go, no go, no go emotional, go emotional, and see what this matches. Okay. I mean, because I, I mean there must be more. There is. Uh, <clears throat> there is a neuron paper in 2007 in which we analyzed the end of trial signals mm -hmm. and you know we did all sorts of like we did lots of experiments go no go and you know there is always this offset response which now uh, people are seeing also in visual cortex for motor responses there is a paper showing for instance motor responses in the EBA area uh, during a pointing task is now evidence in rodents where you have visual tasks and there is feedback signals in the motor cortex in the visual system. So I think this, and in fact, some people like Buzaki might say that the visual system is there because we have the motor system. And so people like Karamatsa say that the specialization in visual cortex is actually coming from the motor system. It's the motor system that is shaping the visual system in this visual motor so I would be surprised if there is only a phasic response in the LC for the go signal. I think there should be multiple go, modulation, which might be a little stronger in the go than no go. Actually, the go versus no go in contrast, just in general, surprised me. There was no, there's no motor cortex. It's pre-motor. So I was, I mean, I wonder whether the if there is much if you go down the threshold, but it seems that there's some curiosities with this, with this task. Well, there's for something else in this context that we should discuss, but we can do this later, later when we saw the data. In some sense, we have to also explain what is now the causal link, right? Amygdala, locus ceruleus, hippocampus, which seems to go against a little bit the standard learning and memory circuits that would link amygdala and hippocampus over the cholinergic system. Yeah. Right? So that's an interesting issue to try to decipher here, but we can maybe come back to that in the discussion. Um.
So, voluntary movement enhances uh, episodic memory, and it's uh, via the noradrenergic mechanism. So we're trying now with propranolol to see whether we can get more evidence uh, for the case. Um, now, I showed you the slide earlier. We'd focus on the amygdala modulation of the hippocampus. Um, and when I talk to you about the striatum, you probably think striatum movement, uh, reward learning, main things that the the research focus for this uh, area has. But also, uh, John Lisman, I know, is quite close to this uh, this lab. So um, I'm a big fan of his models. Uh, this one in particular, where they talk about uh, how important uh, events are remembered better than the mundane. So we talked to you about emotion. I talked to you about emotion, but also anything unexpected. So if you were to come out of here and there'd be an elephant waiting uh, uh, here in the in the foyer. You'd remember that elephant for the rest of your life. So that's uh, another way that memory is enhanced when things are unexpected, like the perceptual oddball that I showed you in the in the in the in the simple word task. Um, and what Lisman and Grace propose is that the actual novelty is detected by the hippocampus, and it sends a signal down to the ventral tegmental area to then send a shot of dopamine back up to the uh, back up to the hippocampus. And as part of this circuit, you have the nucleus accumbens, right? Now, one of the interesting things about the nucleus accumbens uh, clinically these days is it's a, a popular target for deep brain stimulation. So you've probably heard about uh, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's uh, or in the central tremor, dystonia. So it's been very successful in, in neuro neurological patients, but it's now being used more and more in, in psychiatric patients. And so these are medication resistant uh, cases. And the accumbens has been used um, primarily in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder, but also depression, anorexia, uh, schizophrenia, and substance abuse. So this is the the, sort of the, if you get an opportunity to go to these operations, they're really very interesting uh, surgical procedures. So this is the uh, this is the the surgical planning on the Medtronic stealth machine. So you have here the trajectory that, you, that the electrode should be following. So first you put in a microelectrode that records single unit activity, uh, uh, and once you're in the right place, the macroelectrode goes in. That's going to stay there permanently. This is a reconstruction using a software lead DBS that's been uh, together by the Cherry Day. So that's the segmented accumbens. You can see how the electrodes go in. Um, so if you're stimulating the accumbens, you may be making the patients better, but what are you doing to their cognition? If this is such a central hub for taking decisions, uh, for risk, impulsivity, and, as I mentioned before, part of the circuit for episodic memory uh, enhancement. Uh, how effective are these treatments for uh, So, t typically it's a rule of 50%, right? So, 50% get 50% better. Yeah. So, the number, the number is that compared to Parkinson's, you have a 90% or more, more uh, clinical improvement. So, there's a lot of interest now, and it's one of the, the reasons that I'm involved in this, is looking uh, what parameters, imaging parameters, you can use to predict um, to predict who's going to improve or what the best target is, because not all so, and what is it? Not all size fits all. So it might be uh, better to have the stimulation in the accordate as opposed to the accumbens in some patients. So we're actually doing longitudinal trials of different stimulation sites to see whether you can actually work out with the the and the group in Cologne uh, do a lot of this are showing that the, the tractography may be the best predictor. You need to get a sweet spot somewhere. So there's debate at the moment how to get. If I had you know, some of the cases that we've seen here, they've been since age of 10, really disabled. Um, the, you know, the, the, a lot of them don't leave the house. So, but you were given a 50% chance to get substantially better. I, I think I would take that, uh, take that chance, but obviously we can improve on the current percentage. So we did a, the experimental question was whether the, whether the stimulating the accumbens is modulating memory in these patients. So you stimulate 130 hertz, which is thought to knock out activity in a structure because it can't recover. It doesn't have, it's such fast um, stimulation that you're permanently hyperpolarizing the neurons. So that's the idea for the, for the Parkinson's, um, the, the basic idea from the beginning. So just wonder whether you're inhibiting the accumbens, you may be blocking this uh, memory enhancement that they that people typically enjoy for 
uh, saline events. So this is uh, our workflow with these patients. We have preoperative uh, imaging, we also have symptom provocation with fMRI. So we show them unpleasant, uh, for them, unpleasant stimulus, like um, if they have cleaning and washing uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, we show them dirty things, or we have pictures of the iron and say, you know, you have to think about whether you've turned this off before. So that's for the, the pre-surgical mapping. Uh, we do some single unit recordings in the awake patient, and then post-operatively we do these on-off cognitive studies followed by this two-year clinical trial. We have different contacts that are being, uh, being stimulated. Um, so, uh, so far in the sense that I've uh, been collaborating with, they've done OCD in 12 cases. Um, they've done one depression and one anorexia nervosa case. So I'll show you which one's going because not ev not everyone did the did the task. Well, uh, the the depressed uh, case was a doctor himself, so he then decided what he was going to do, and uh, didn't listen to the surgeon but anyway. Well, how was his prediction? <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've lost track of him, but I, I, I he must be fine because he doesn't come back to follow up clinics. Yeah. Um, and so this is a task we did. So this is uh, in the six weeks after they had it implanted the electrode. So this, they're off during that period. It, immediately after the electrode goes in, the patients are better. Um, they change a little bit in their uh, in their symptoms. Something called a stunning effect. You see quite a lot in Parkinson's. So the, uh, probably local edema affecting the state. So we wait. They wait six weeks before this. this is, so this is just about. This is just before chronic stimulation starts. You can think this relatively a virgin brain in terms of stimulation. Uh, so this is with seven OCD patients and one with anorexia, uh, so eight patients uh, so far. And similar task, except here we have the, the pleasant stimuli, uh, and then we also have oddball responses, so these are black and white objects um, against these scenes, again, all taken from the, uh, from the IAPS. And this is the, the, the task manipulation, so it's continuous to show them the images, and then in uh, two two-minute segments, we just turn the stimulator on, right? So for them, we don't tell them which uh, which of these two two two-minute segments uh, we're going to stimulate. Uh, we ask them at the end, and they really uh, ha are at chance in telling you when it was turned on. Um, and this, these are the standard clinical parameters for stimulating at 130 hertz, uh, and they do. You know, the memory's not too bad in the patients, and what we see is when the stimulator goes on, you have an improvement in their memory. So this is the probability of after having, uh, the probability of later having a correct, form, a correct memory response. So they improve the efficiency of encoding when the stimulator is on. And this is relative, it's not, not something to do with the task, so we've done some control patients that don't have the stimulators that were, were brought to clinic to be offered the treatment, but they turned it down, so they have a similar level of OCD, and you see that actually they don't have uh, any difference between the on, off versus on. The, it's really the R responses, so the ones that they say they remembered and not the ones that they're familiar with, because that's, again, uh, very little memory uh, for the condition, so it's, it's really the episodic remembrance effect. So in RK, the first one, is this statistically significant, the difference? It's trend at 0.06 or so. I need more patients. So I need more subjects. Yeah, I need more patients. Uh, this is, this is going to be good. R, K, and R, so is it like... This is pulled together, the two, uh, the, the, the two word uh, image types. So this is, for the ones they say, I remember, I have an episodic sense of remembering. And the, and the K is just, I feel familiar with the, with the items. There's a classic dissociation, which in Spanish has a very good translation, actually, because me acuerdo o me suena. Uh, como me suena tu cara, for people that speak Spanish, it's, uh, it is what the familiarity response is trying to tap into. Um, so yes, this is, this is significant, and this is, uh, this is unpublished because I'm waiting to get more cases. Uh, and you see that the neutral stimuli, this is time here, so this is as we start and then go up to the sixth block. You can see basically how memory is is uh, being improved for the not not all patients. You have some that uh, 
as always, don't follow the same trend. But in general, uh, you see when the, the simulator goes on, they start remembering better. Diego? Yeah. Yeah, so for the two minutes, it's on for the whole time. So here, look. So it's off. Every two minutes, I pretend to fiddle with the, in some cases, pretend to turn it on. And in other cases, I do turn it on and then turn it off, turn it on. Well, for ideal candidate for? Uh, at least in the hippocampus, but stimulating the hippocampus impairs memory, so no one's managed to get a. It could be. Now, it depends. It depends what the DBS is doing. Um, I mean, 130 hertz could be inhibitory, as I mentioned, because you're chronically depolarizing. But what are the uh, hyperpolarizing? But what are the cell types in the in the accumbens? They're mainly inhibitory. So it could be that you're inhibiting the inhibition. So we see. I I, I can show you some uh, some slides of some animal studies we've done now, where we do the same stimulation, and you see that you get increased. So it's animal. It's DBS in rodents uh, with simultaneous fMRI. So you see that there's an increase in the bold response in the hippocampus, the VTA, uh, the medial septum, so all the areas that are good for memory. Yeah. Um, so, but, so, but in some sense, you know, you could also argue, okay, big deal, right? Like people are also doing TMS. To, via the frontal cortex to get into the nucleus accumbens and in that sense boost also reward systems, right? So you could also argue, okay, so if you if you crank up activity in nucleus accumbens, this is what you would expect to see. Mm -hmm. But this is not a trivial result, right? Because it will also depend on your specific stimulation parameters and so on. Right? So so can you can you differentiate a little bit here what what's the fundamental insight? Ah, okay. Well it's um this is probably the slide uh, that will. That it's more. This is more of a clinical question, right? Sure, yeah. So, for the fundamental is that people have tried to use DBS to improve cognition in dementia cases or early dementia cases. So, this is the and uh, the neurosurgeon Andres Lozano uh, was stimulating the uh, the what well, the fornix originally was on the basis of one patient that had hypothalam hypothalamic uh, electrodes that showed. Had memory retrieval experiences when the stim when the stimulator came on, and they took it straight to clinical trial in Alzheimer's patients, and it seemed to be beneficial in some cases in the small study, and then when it went to a larger scale study, the the effects weren't present. And other people have tried to stimulate the nucleus basalis of minors, um, and also haven't had success in in Alzheimer's. Uh, and there's been a lot of interest in the enter stimulating the enterrhinal cortex uh, as well. Again, this is not based on solid preclinical, I call it preclinical, so not dementia cases, evidence that you can get an enhancement with the stimulation, uh, with a set of stimulation parameters. Um, so if you want to take DBS forward as a possible way to improve memory in patients, the accumbens makes a lot more sense as a target because it's not that early affected. I mean, why would you try the enterrhinal cortex? I and mean, you lose the, the layers that project from the enterrhinal cortex to the hippocampus are the first things you lose in, uh, in, in, in Alzheimer's. Um, again, nucleus basalis of minor and the fornix are pretty sharp in the early stages, but the accumbens is relatively resistant uh, to the disease at the early stages. So, I mean, the fundamental, uh, the, the fundamental insight is that you have an, an, another possibility. Uh, and also here, and I'm sure that when I get more uh, more patients, that the salient stimulus is the one that's going to be the most uh, the most beneficial. So that's also worth, it sort of adds weight uh, to it. But the, conceptually, it's more of a, it's more of a boost to the Lisman and Grace uh, theory. Right. Yeah. Victoria or Vicky. And does it also improve, I mean, accuracy, it seems, right? So they remember more, but 
is there any relation to time? Like, do they remember faster? Is there... Good question. No. No, so the ones where we looked at that, so at recognition, do they go faster? Uh, there is a, an effect between groups, so the people that have been stimulated are in general faster than the controls, but they're not, they're nothing selective for the, the, the trials in which they were, had the stimulator on for. But it's a good question. Okay, so when I was talking about, oh, this basically shows that the, the amount you get of memory enhancement you get on this little test of mine with the, with the IAPS correlates with long-term memory improvement on neuropsychological testing for verbal memory uh, in the patients after they've been stimulated for several months. But again, I need more patients. So this was how long after the intervention? So this is it depended on the it depended on the on the patient because they had when the accumbens were stimulated was random compared to the chordate stimulation. Right, so when contact zero was stimulated within the accumbens, could be up to a year after the intervention. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so it's a particularly salient oddball stimuli. We can start telling patients about this good side effect of their treatment, uh, which does seem quite consistent, for, at least in our center, that patients' memory improves. And um, this has a potential translational significance if we're still going to go down the line of, of chronic stimulation for, as, a, as a means of managing neurodegenerative uh, memory loss. Which brings me to the next question. So who needs better memory? As I said before, I, uh, we have one focus in uh, one lab in the, uh, in the engineering university and the other one is in the, an Alzheimer's center. So this is uh, a center where there's 156 beds of inpatients with Alzheimer's disease. So that's a residence. Uh, you have a brain bank in the basement, so that when the residents pass away, they donate their, their brains for post-mortem uh, histological diagnosis. And you also have an MRI. My, uh, the MRI scan is attached to the, uh, uh, the next door to the, the brain bank, so we have a flow of, of, of workflow. So the patients have um, serial scanning and then have uh, their brain donation. And we also have a a uh, large uh, longitudinal study going on in Madrid called the uh, called the Vallecas project, which is looking at this question. So, who needs better memory? Um, a lot of focus now with uh, with Alzheimer's or uh, other neurodegenerative condi conditions is trying to catch them as early as you can. Um, so, they stop Alzheimer's before it starts. Uh, there are several trials going on at the moment to try to do this. Uh, and so the question is, who is at risk? So maybe some interventions. I don't mean necessarily bombarding them with anti-amyloid antibodies or uh, any other uh, of the, the treatments under the trial. I just mean you, know, you can address lifestyle factors for these individuals, so aggressive lowering of blood pressure, cholesterol, so the, the cardiovascular risk factors you could uh, target. Um, so I'm going to talk to you again about psychological and voxel-based morphometry. Um, this is the the classic curves that um, that Jürgen was showing yesterday, so Clifford Jack's curves. So your cognitive normal, go to mild cognitive impairment, and then dementia. Uh, and you've seen that the amyloid and tower deposition start before you have any symptoms. Now, typically, people are looking, I think you have a paper on this, Jürgen. They're looking, so, so looking at their transition from MCI to dementia, because not always everyone goes MCI to dementia, or they take different times for, them to, for this to happen. Uh, so that's what the majority of the research effort is, whereas what this Vallecas project is aimed at doing is looking still at the cognitively normal stage and saying, can I project who goes to MCI? So it's, it's difficult because you have an elderly, well, we have an elderly population between 70 and 85, um, and what we do is you follow them up in time, some of them develop mild cognitive impairment, and the idea is then to go retrospectively and identify the MCI people, but they're clinically indistinguishable from, from the ones that don't develop MCI, so they're people that in the future are going to run into trouble. Right? Um, so we have 1,200 subjects that have been uh, followed up on this. Some of them already had MCI, so the, the, the control group here were uh, just, just under 1,100. This is the, our group. Uh, mild cognitive impairment was used was diagnosed on the basis of the Peterson criteria. 
Um, there are three types of MCI, amnestic, non-amnestic, uh, and multiple domain. So we're, we're dealing particularly with the amnestic and, and multiple domain uh, MCI for our, our analysis. And this is where we are with the study. It's just a, sorry, it's a slide, I have not translate the slide. So first down to the sixth visit have been completed. Uh, so we're now for some patients up to their eighth visit. So we have a visit every year. Right, so then in the eighth year of follow-up, we started with a thousand. We're now down to simply less. You, know, you have attrition of the patient. A lot, a lot. They're quite loyal, the subjects, but then you know they have their other health problems, or they can have something that doesn't mean they can go into the MRI anymore. Uh, we still have our core group uh, going about five or six hundred uh, that are being followed up on year, yearly basis, and every year neurological evaluation, intensive psychological testing. Uh, multi-sequence uh, MRI and uh, also they have genetics done. So the, the standard, or the, the, the most popular at-risk uh, genes were uh, were done immediately. So the APOE, for example, APOE, E4, E3 polymorphism was done. And now it's gone to GWAS in collaboration with uh, a, a group here in, in, in Barcelona. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how we're looking at the results. Some of the first, the first question here is, can you detect any differences in the brain uh, or behaviorally in people that we're going to convert in the future versus those that, uh, versus those that don't, um, given that they're clinically indistinguishable? And then we have, uh, which I'll uh, I talk to you if you're, if you're interested, we have a few slides on prediction. So that's the ultimate thing. So if I pull someone off the street, and say, well, what is your risk to convert to MCI within a year, even though that you're healthy? Uh, so for this analysis, this just fo focuses on the first and second visit. So we had uh, some exclusions. So we wanted to make sure the controls are really controls and converters. So those that go from healthy to MCI were really uh, our converters. So we took everyone needed a mini mental state uh, above 27, uh, clinical dementia rating above zero, uh, and abnormal MRI findings uh, were also removed. And that gave us 23 converters, amnestic and multi-domains, and 790 uh, non-converter controls. And just How look- How strokes did you have in the group so far? Well, I couldn't tell you offhand, okay. but they'd be taken out. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have, there's, and it's well documented. So we have now, uh, this has been, it's quite a lot of work, uh, <laughs> the database. So we have every subject, every visit has number of, uh, you know, uh, large territory stroke, uh, microinfarcts, lacuna strokes. It's all, it, it's all in a database. Yeah, come to Madrid and you can take a look at it. <laughs> there's, yeah, it's a very rich data set, to be honest. I mean, it, it doesn't have the numbers of ADNI, but it has the advantages of being single sign and it's very homo homogeneous. Some of the sequences aren't great. I inherited those, and I'm not going to change them halfway through the uh, uh, halfway through the longitudinal study. But they, it's a good data set. Um, and if you look at the three teams, so this is uh, just the voxel-based morphometry workflow that, that I mentioned before. You segment. This is using Dartel and SPM12. For those of you who know, so you can do uh, uh, segmentation some sort of smooth in the group comparison. And you see, when you do the group comparison, that the, uh, that the effects are very focal, highly significant effects, uh, and very focal to the medial temporal loop. So even though you have no symptoms compared to the group of, of controls, you have less uh, gray matter density in the enterorhinal cortex, in the hippocampus, and also in the amygdala, which was a bit of a surprise. But there we go, the amygdala was the most significant there. Um, and there were certain things that they were also lower as a group. So um, the well, they tended to be more male than more female than male. Uh, had more APOE4, uh, which you'd expect, and they are statistically down on a certain number of parameters. Right. So that even though they're within normal limits, so in the normal limits for their age, said on said on the standard neuropsychological testing. They're in the lower range of the normal limit. Now, there's a, uh, a problem here, like with any longitudinal study, where it's observational. So you, you haven't ran, randomly selected your individuals like you would do in a randomized control study. Um, and you have confounds. So 
if they're more APOE4, and some if you believe that APOE4 affects brain structure, so these effects that I'm showing you are actually down to the APOE4, not uh, anything else, right? So you can you can control from this doing a, a match sampling technique. So because we had so many controls, you can then say, okay, this converter, so the person who in one year's time will develop MCI, is an 80-year-old female uh, with uh, APOE3, uh, E3, 4. So you then find the closest match in your controls that is an 80-year-old female, APOE3, or 4, uh, and also has the same number of years of education and uh, a mini mental state. Right? So if we do that, so you end up from 790 controls, you're down to 23 controls that are tightly matched to the uh, 23 converters. Uh, and they're still memory, the, this FCSRT, if you haven't heard of it, so this is free queued selective reminding task, which is uh, a verbal memory task that has a semantic category component that I think is a great test um, for damage to the medial temporal lobe. Uh, Hippocampal volume was still down, and also FAQ. So that's the um, lifestyle, sorry, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, functional activities questionnaire. So if you're able to do things on your own well, right? So if you can go, go shopping on your own or you don't get lost. So this was also down. And when you look at the, you know, the voxel based morphology, now it's very focal. So the only thing that survives whole brain, uh, uh, survives whole brain family wise correction. It's here in the in the left anterior six. So it's very focal. This is before any symptoms or deficits uh, appear. So one year early. Um, so as I mentioned after, Can because you say I, about the extent of this change, because you just showed that is very focal at really? at okay. just one or just a view. at that. Well, this is one of the problems with fMRI that your um, it's never uh, binary. So you have that is the peak. Of you know, you, if, if you drop the threshold down, you have most of the brain. If you're at 0.05 uncorrected, yeah. So, I mean, this will go. This, if you drop the threshold down, it starts looking more similar to this because you can see here it's the same. It's the same area that we're indexed uh, in this main. No, no, it's sort of extension. Not, not much. And we've looked at that in particular because some of the reviewers in the original version of this paper were like, okay, so is it anterolateral entorhinal cortex or posterior medial? Just because, so for those of you that don't work on entorhinal cortex, you probably know about the grid cells, right? So grid cells were discovered as a potential universal map of space uh, with these hexagonal firing patterns. Uh, and they are found in the medial entorhinal cortex, right? And the human equivalent appears to be the posterior medial entorhinal cortex. Um, and groups in, uh, in Germany and Holland have produced their own probabilistic maps. So we've actually looked at the gray matter density using those maps warped onto each of our subjects. And I don't see any differences. So they're both affected. Actually, that, that point is the confluence between both mask of antrolatron and posterior medial. Yeah. So, um, Afterwards, I can show you the, the, the efforts we're doing uh, to use these parameters to, uh, to build a predictive model or classify uh, of whether you can, uh, uh, whether you're going to develop MCI or not. So, uh, and we're, it's working relatively well because we need to wait for a validation sample. So enough people to convert to MCI in later visits. So it's taken a, a little while, but it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, okay, so the, the second phase I wanted to talk to you about, so that was making memory better and who needs memory to be better. Now I'll talk to you briefly about how to make memory deliberately worse. So um, as I mentioned, there are some sub so there are some patients in which they have very strong, unpleasant memories so that preclude them from doing things. So people, I don't know, post-traumatic stress disorder is taken as the, the, the sort of archetypal example. It's quite a complex disease. Um, so these people have a particular traumatic episode which then sets up uh, subsequent flashbacks um, for for their condition, nightmares, etc. Phobias are another good example of this. So if you you know you have a uh, say you get bitten by a dog, you then don't want to be near dogs. So if you had the memory of the dog bite reduced, maybe it would help you with your uh, 
with your problem of fearing dogs. And the classical view of memory would make this very difficult because memory was thought to be you encode, you consolidate, and you retrieve, and that's it, right? But now there's movements. Uh, I mean, this actually started in the 70s, but then was sort of suppressed, this literature. Um, a process called reconsolidation. So basically saying that when you retrieve a memory, uh, it then becomes fragile again. Or you can get at it, you can manipulate it. And this is a um, part of a, a bigger movement in terms of viewing memories are more dynamic than kind of stuck uh, in a set in the brain that we thought before. So reconsolidation was back, was brought back to uh, the forefront in this Nature paper in 2000 by uh, Karim Nader and Joe Ledoux. And they did the following. So this is in rats. So the control group did fear conditioning on the rats. So they had uh, tone, predicts a shock. The rat learns to fear the shock. Then the second day they come back, they hear the tone, the rat freezes, which is remembered the association. Then they injected uh, saline into his amygdala, his per amygdala. Uh, on the subsequent day, uh, here's the tone, and the rat freezes, completely as you would expect, right? But in the test group, they had the same training. Then on the second day, the rat hears the tone and freezes, so it remembers that the uh, that the tone predicts a shock. At that stage, they injected a, a protein synthesis inhibitor which blocks consolidation of memories, lenice and mycin, into the amygdala. And the following day, the rat comes back, hears a tone, and doesn't freeze. Right? So there was a taking this evidence that every time you retrieve a memory, you need to consolidate it again for it to become uh, long-lasting uh, long or enduring. Now, it's difficult to uh, give people uh, injections of a uh, protein synthesis inhibitor into their amygdala. So this has been quite difficult to show that this effect really happens in humans. Um, but electroconvulsive therapy was actually the first, uh, the first demonstration in the 60s and 70s that showed this phenomenon had used electroconvulsive shock in the rats uh, to show that you can uh, reduce memory post-retrieval. So we thought, well, there are patients undergoing electroconvulsive therapy for their psychiatric conditions. Uh, and the PhD student of mine, Ryan Crows, that um, we supervised with Guillen Fernandez and at the Donders Institute, um, we did this study in the Netherlands. And um, the experimental protocol like this, we had three groups. Uh, group A is the most important group. Um, all three groups had a study session where they viewed two slideshow narratives uh, and in the second session um, that was a, a week later they came for the patient came for their ECT so they were going undergoing uh, every month they were having ECT so we knew when it was scheduled for and what, what we did just before they had their ECT the patients were shown the first slide of one of the two slideshow stories that had been studied in session one Right? And there are some questions on that slide. Then a few minutes later, they had the ECT. Uh, and then one day later for, for group A, they had a test, a memory test for the two stories. Group B had the memory test immediately afterwards, immediately after they came around from the ECT. Right? And group C, group C was our control group. So these are patients that didn't have ECT at that time. So they were, we did the test so they were staggered between their ECT sessions. So they didn't deliver any ECT. They didn't have ECT, right? So this is important. Like with consolidation of memory, it doesn't happen immediately. And reconsolidation appears to be the same. You need some time for the, uh, for the effect to, to manifest, right? So it was really, we were looking for group A to show an effect and not group B. Uh, these are the stories. So what the, the prediction is that will not be consolidated. Exactly. So they're not going to reconsolidate. They're not going to reconsolidate the particular story that was reactivated. So that's why we had the two stories. But isn't that known that ECT disrupts memory of events? Disrupts memory, you're quite right. So it disrupts memory for consolidation. And that's been known for, since Squire did the studies in the 70s. So the difference here is that the, 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 the memory is selectively disrupted for the reactivated story. 
you have to bring it back into your mind, then get the ECT. So it's it, it's things that have been consolidated already, material that's been consolidated a week before. No, it is emotional memory. Yeah, I'll show you that. This is these are the stories. So this is uh, important. So these are. This is, these are stories that, uh, I mean, if you think about the IAPs being uh, old fashioned, this is also quite old fashioned. So this, these are called the Cahill stories because Larry Cahill together with McGough in California put these, uh, these stories together. So this is the classic one of the boy that goes, so they're narrated slide stories. Uh, so the boy that goes one day, her mother and her son leave the house in the morning and then the son goes to, with the father to work. Uh, and you have a neutral version and the emotional version of the story. And then basically the son is involved in a, the When they cross the road, the boy is hit by an out of control car, which mortally injures him. So the initial phase and the last phase are emotionally neutral. But the middle, the middle phase is the emotionally unpleasant one. So you, um, you have a dissociation between the phases is important for the next study I'm going to show you, right? Nothing positive. I don't work really that much on the positive things. No, so if we're modeling, <laughs> if we're interested in, in something to do with uh, uh, something to do with phobia or post-traumatic stress, we wanted to make it emotionally aversive. So it has again a, a long-term clinical goal. Yeah, but we could redo it. But it, uh, despite the fact that it takes a long time to do these experiments, it, the positive thing. A lot of people have asked me actually. Particularly with this, the study I'll show you in a minute is more applicable to to more people because it doesn't involve ECT but anesthesia. Um, so that was one of the stories, and the other story, which is uh, is quite different. So it's in a different. It's a it's a female narrator uh, with uh, digital as opposed to these uh, more old-fashioned slides to make them as distinct as possible. Uh, so you have, again, a neutral phase when the two sisters leave from the apartment around midnight. And when they pass an alley, the younger sister is taken hostage by an escaped uh, convict who physically, seriously, physically molests her. So this is the emotional uh, part of it. And then it goes back to a, a, a neutral part of the story. So there are two stories they learn. One with a, boy, a young boy that gets in a car accident and the other is a girl that gets uh, attacked. And what we saw with this study, well, first of all, look at group C. So in group C, what we show is that when, so this is the group that didn't have any, uh, any ECT at all. So group C, when they, they actually have better memory for the reactivated story. So what, if, I was a, if I was a patient, what would happen is I would be shown this story and had a little bit of a break and then shown that story. And then if just before my ECT, for example, I'd be shown this slide and would be asked, it would be parts covered up of the slide and be asked, you know, who is behind this? Uh, and you say, oh, the, the little boy, and who is behind that? So you had a series of questions that we need to, the patient would have to answer. So we made sure that they reactivated that slide and, and then the rest of the, uh, the story would let the brain do the rest. And you see that if you don't have an ECT, your memory is actually better for the reactivated story versus the one that wasn't reactivated. In group B, where there's a very short time between, uh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, the, so the, so it's a recognition task. So you have a recognition task on each uh, on each slide of the the uh, the slideshow story. You get asked a series of questions. So this is in the case of groups A and C was 24 hours after the reactivation, and group B was about an hour after they came around from their ECT. Right? So it's basically just taking the scores on a recognition, multiple choice out of four. So chance in the, t in the test is 25%. Uh, okay. So group A was one day post? Group A was one day post ECT. Group A and group C are one day post, well, post reactivation because group C didn't have the ECT. Exactly. And group B, no difference. So those ones that are immediately tested, whereas group A, I mean, the memory is bad, right? So these are patients with severe unipolar depression uh, undergoing ECT, so memory is not great anyway. Um, but you see that the memory for the reactivated story goes back, goes down to chance, right? So that was our, our main finding from that study. So you could t the one that was reactivated and tested 24 hours later 
uh, shows worse memory than the non-reactivated story. That's sorry. Was the effect between the groups of the non-reactivated also significant? Yeah. Uh, this one. Yes, but in, uh, no. Was there a difference? No, I don't, I don't remember. Like it's it's just maybe, yeah. So that's interesting, but what's the problem? One, as a treatment, you're, it's going to be very difficult to persuade people to have ECT. ECT has a, unfortunately a bad reputation, particularly after the Jack Nicholson movie. Um, and um, scientifically, well, from a memory perspective, these patients have very bad memories, so um, you know our effect sizes wasn't wasn't that big, um, and also electrical emulsive therapy nowadays involves more than just passing the electric current across the cranium. So that's the E part, but the the C part is that you know, the patient has the convulsion, um, and then the therapy in general. You have a general anesthesia given to you before the ECT, so it's under a very controlled conditions, so the convulsion, actually you have a muscle relaxant, uh, you have a tourniquet over your ankle, so you can just see the seizure in your foot, uh, so it's not the, in any way, the barbaric things are port portrayed in, in, in the media. Um, but is it the E, the electricity, the convulsion, or, or neither? So we thought, well, if, if it's the anesthesia, uh, it'd be worth testing, because anesthesia is something they're given relatively routinely now in the clinical setting. I didn't want to give people anesthetics so we're not going to have an anesthetic otherwise. So I thought psychiatrically normal people that are having anesthesia on a routine outpatient basis, well, you have hundreds per day going through the general hospitals that are having endoscopies. So they either have tube down the throat or the other from the, um, or, or a colonoscopy uh, and in Spain, at least, they get given propofol, which is a general anaesthetic, uh, before the procedure. So we uh, we let the anaesthetists do what they what they want. They're all going to give propofol. Some want to give a little bit of, um, uh, of other agents like uh, our fentanyl, or which is an opiate derivative, or or a benzodiazepine. We didn't interfere with that because we're not going to interfere with the normal practice. But we asked people coming for endoscopy whether they would like to do a memory study associated with their anesthesia. Um, this is Anna Galarza who did the. Sorry? Where, sorry? 25 MCG. Oh, sorry, micrograms. So that's the dose. That's the dose of the drug. So additional to the 10 to 40, which is normally. So this, uh, yeah, so it's basically it depends how long the how long the procedure lasts. So you give a certain amount, yeah. It depends because some had both colonoscopy and endoscopy, so they lasted quite uh, a bit longer. Um, Anna, who is my PhD student, who's now working in Biogen, uh, did the study. And it's the same task, we just removed group C, so the people that are not undergoing uh, anesthesia. Um, so they agreed to come a week before into the hospital to learn the two stories, the exact same stories, just translated from Dutch into Spanish. And so they went through the original study session of both the stories, then had their reactivation immediately before, uh, immediately before they had their anesthesia and their procedure. And then in group A had the test 24 hours later, whereas group B had their test immediately afterwards. So the same as the ECT study. Uh, and what we showed in group A was that, but there was a there was a main effect between groups, an interaction, sorry. So for group A, the reactivated story was in general lower, just like we'd seen uh, in the ECT study. And when we unpacked the, the three phases, we found that the effect was entirely driven by a reduction of memory with this middle phase that I mentioned to you earlier that has the emotional content. So the neutral phases were not affected uh, but just in group A, the emotional phase was, uh, memory for the emotional phase was disrupted. Whereas in group B, again, there was no difference between reactivated and non-reactivated. Um, so there, the conclusion that the short acting general anesthesia you can apply immediately after reactivation of emotion negative story and impairs the subsequent retrieval of the emotional component of the story only. So this could be quite a promising line to pursue uh, and, and, and refine to perhaps apply in a clinical setting.
So in summary, the memory is malleable. You can make it better and you can make it worse. And I think that we're now reaching a stage where this could have uh, some interesting uh, clinical applications. So with that, there's a lot of people uh, that have been involved uh, in the work in, in Spain and in, in Holland also acknowledge a previous uh, group in, in Institute of Neurology in London and our funding bodies. And thank you for your attention.